Good morning, everyone. Here we are again, here, together, and apart. And I'd love to say it's good to be together, but maybe it is good to be apart and, and connected in all these various ways and connected with people all over the world, with all over our province, in a way that we wouldn't be if we were together. So trying to count my blessings, I'm thankful to be here, and I'm thankful that you are there on the other side of the screen. So good morning and welcome. This morning, we're going to dive right back in to 2 Corinthians, the teachings of Paul. And Paul can be a little bit of a rough around the edges guy. He has a bit of a reputation of being harsh. And I want to look at these words of Paul and just really dig in to what it was he might have been meaning, um, trying to come to the text with some grace and some understanding. So a little bit of background about this letter, second letter to the Corinthians. Um, Paul had actually been criticized quite heavily for his suffering, for the ways that things were playing out in his ministry, um, his persecution, and the fact that things weren't coming up roses and beautiful and everything wasn't going fine. He was minimized and he was dismissed because of the lack of evidence that God was on his side. And I just want to point out that this is a subtle form of a prosperity gospel. You know, we, we say, oh, I don't have a prosperity gospel. I don't think that if I believe in Jesus that I'm going to be rich. But sometimes we have a prosperity gospel thinking when we believe that if I believe in Jesus, if I follow God and I um, obey him, then my life is going to be easier. Maybe I am going to experience healing. There are many among our number who know that that's not the case. We can be followers of Jesus and not experience that healing. Um, and so I just want to caution against that type, that subtle kind of prosperity gospel that Paul was up against. And uh, look at a little more of the context. I looked at what, what, who were these people in the city of Corinth? So the city of Corinth itself was a large city. It was made up with a, um, of a mixture of Greeks, Romans, and Jews. The city itself was actually a historic battleground. It saw much suffering and uh, a lot of violence over the centuries. And the Greeks, at least, who had been there the longest, they explained away the atrocities as punishment or maybe merely amusement of the gods. You know, in seeking to understand um, the universal problem of suffering, the Greeks had decided that there must be different kinds of gods, some vindictive, some good, and some merely careless or ambivalent. And these gods were the cause of all their troubles. And we can see, looking back on history, why they might have believed that. So this is a little of the context of the city of Corinth, um, that Paul was writing to, and a little of the history of why Paul was writing to them because of their um, lack of understanding of his ministry and what was happening there. So I'd like to just dive right in to right in the middle of chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Um, Paul writes, Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. And I asked these questions as I read these verses. What, what does Paul mean? Who is it that he's trying to persuade and persuade them of what? So we have already covered that Paul was being judged, and he was being judged by outward appearances. He was being judged by the fact that his ministry was experiencing um, difficulty or opposition, and that he wasn't just clear sailing. Um, so the, the two groups that I actually want to look at, the Jews and the Greeks, would have both had an equal um, tendency to look at an outward appearance 
as a way of judging things. For the Jews, um, they were concerned about presenting a morally superior self. So they were going to follow all the rules and do all the things and make themselves look morally pure. Um, I'm, I don't want to paint them just with that one brush and say they were all only that way, but as a general rule, that was the way that they viewed life. The way that they viewed things was, is really important to look morally pure and clean. Um, the Greeks, they also really valued the outward appearance. They valued physical beauty. Um, they valued um, grandiose artistic buildings and um, beautiful people and bodies. And so a lot of their where they were coming from was also looking at the outward appearance. Paul's persuasion is to look at life or to look at things through another lens. What if there was another way to view one another, a different way that didn't look at outward appearance, that didn't look at what it appeared to be? Paul really was suggesting that they look at things through the lens of compassion or the intention behind actions. Paul suggested maybe they could evaluate people based on how well they loved. It's really easy to fall into the trap of um, assessing and evaluating things by outward appearances. Um, but Paul says maybe we should assess something by how well it upholds the value of humanity instead of how pure it looks or how costly or grandiose it was. He suggests the Corinthians assess his worth through the lens of the man who ate with sinners. He's inviting, Paul is inviting the Corinthians to step outside their current evaluation paradigms. And this is a hard thing to do. I can think of a, uh, a current, a modern example. There's a movement these days, and maybe you've heard of it, and it's called body positivity. Uh, and there are people who, you know, would really preach this idea. It's a different way of evaluating the value or the worth of, of each other and really in a, in a great way of ourselves. Uh, because we subconsciously value and devalue people all the time uh, based on our appearance, our lifestyle choices, our career path, economic status, speech patterns. This is another form of the prosperity gospel, is saying, if you follow Christ, if you are doing, if you are living the way you should, then all of these, these things will be in line. Back to the example of the body positivity um, preaching or teaching, it helps train us to look at our bodies, to look at ourselves as valuable, even when maybe we have flabby arms or a pot belly or something that we don't consider desirable, but loving and, and believing in the worth and the value of our own bodies and the bodies of, of each other without um, them being meeting these certain specific standards. Um, this way of just retraining our mind, retraining our attitude to view something through a different lens is helpful. It's healthy. And this is what Paul was, was asking the Corinthians to do. Graham talked last week about the earlier part of chapter 5 um, and concluded that what we do, and really Paul was saying this, what we do with our bodies actually matters. What we do here and now on earth in this physical place, it actually matters. So pay attention to how you allow yourself to think about others because thoughts become actions. And I can see that I need to hear this message that Paul was, was preaching a little bit in these verses that I shouldn't give myself a pass for dehumanizing someone when they're different from me or when their outcome or their um, life experiences are not what I would choose or are not um, pleasant. We need to value people the way God values them. We need to evaluate them with the lens and with the mechanisms that God evaluates them with. And really, Jesus taught that we need to love our neighbors as ourselves, and that is the final word on how we value each other. 
All right, so that's two verses done. Let's move on to um, verses 13 to 15. So Paul writes, If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. A number of questions came as I read these verses. I wondered, why was Paul willing to be perceived as out of his mind? What was so critical that he cared only for God and for those to whom he ministered? What is it that Paul is convinced of? You know, Paul was convinced of a God who loved so completely that any consequences of the choices of humanity were laid on his own son. I really believe this was what Paul was convinced of. This was a radical concept. You might not find that to be a radical concept. Uh, maybe you've heard it before. But this was a radical concept for the day and for the, to the people in Paul's um, to, to whom he was writing. To the Jews, they had always believed in a hierarchy with God at the top. And God must not leave the top. He must stay there. It was set in stone. They would strive to ascend the hierarchy, to be close to God. That was their lifelong goal. The idea of God leaving the top and coming down in solidarity, um, one dying for all, was impossible. It seemed like it went against everything they believed in. To the Greeks, it was, it was less should and more would. You know, the gods really were ambivalent to the mortals, and they expected the mortals to serve them, not the other way around. A supreme being suffering in solidarity with the mortals? Now, that was a crazy concept. More than 2,000 years later, we have not come so far as you might think. There's a popular song by Hosier, and one of the lines says, um, take me to church, I'll, t I'll tell you my sins, so you can sharpen your knife. And I think this line reveals the way many feel about the church, and also the way many feel about God. Even Christians, actually maybe even especially Christians, can fall into this way of thinking. We can stop thinking of Jesus on the cross in a loving and giving solidarity, um, dying for our sins. And we can start thinking about God as some kind of a cosmic scrooge, counting up all of our sins and failures and stacking them up like coins on his desk. You know, when we fall into that way of thinking about God, and it happens often, we really need this message from Paul. We need this call to recalibrate our lens. We need Paul's radical view of God as loving, to wash away our inherent imposter syndrome, our belief that we must strive for God's acceptance and love. What if the purpose of the cross was to open our eyes to the extent of God's love for us? What if the cross shows us the way God loves us? Do you sometimes sink into that feeling of a feeling unworthy and unloved and maybe invisible to God? I know I do. And when I feel that way, I need to take that heaviness, that weight, and I don't need to hold on to it. I don't need to cult cultivate it. I need to bring it into the light of the cross. I need to bring it to the place that reminds me of a God who loved me so much that he came here. You know, it's, it's clear from these verses that Paul believes that his grand mission is to communicate the truth about what God is like. How did Paul know what God was like? Uh, you've heard many times the story of Paul on the Damascus Road being met by Christ there. And then Paul goes off into the, into the desert later, and, and it's believed that he met Christ again in the desert, and that's where he gained his understanding of who God was. Now Paul joyfully endures persecution. 
for the purpose of opening anyone's eyes, anyone who will listen to the glorious reunion awaiting them with their loving, loving creator. Paul's desire is for others to be able to glimpse God the way he sees him. All right, on to the next part. Two more verses, verses 16 and 17. Paul writes, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. I wondered, what is this worldly point of view? What does Paul mean that we saw Christ this way? And what does he mean by new creation? You know, the Corinthians did the math, and in the end, they concluded, like Job's friends, that Paul must be enduring punishment from God. Job's friends did that. They saw Job's suffering, and they said, Job, you've sinned. This is the exact opposite view of God that Paul had been teaching them. He now urges them. He says, throw away that old accounting system. Don't believe that God is that kind of punisher, that kind of counting up sins and looking for a way to hold you accountable and to make sure that, that you face punishment. Paul reminds them, you know, you changed your mind about Jesus. You need that same perspective here. Paul urges the Corinthians to remember what happened in their heart, the change they experienced when they saw Jesus as God's son, accepting and believing that he was God, suffering on their behalf, and in solidarity with humanity, instead of a scoundrel being punished by God. Because truly, their hearts had shifted. And they had been able to receive the idea, the um, overwhelming, beautiful concept of Jesus as God's son, instead of Jesus as simply a failed revolutionary. Paul says, that change that happened in your heart, you need to apply that here. He compels them to extend this lens, allowing it to cover their entire worldview. This new worldview one seen through the lens of grace and love, Paul calls that new creation. This new creation, it's an understanding of the world that is motivated by compassion and love and grace. This brings us to the, um, my favorite part of this whole passage, verses 18 to 20. Paul writes, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. These verses beg the questions, what is the ministry of reconciliation? And who is it that's in need of reconciliation? And how does this all come about? We were once close, united together with God. We were in agreement about who God is and about who we were. Being in need of reconciliation suggests that someone's understanding changed. If there's a discrepancy between God's view of things and my view of things, then we are not in agreement. We often hear of sin, our sin, as being a barrier to a relationship with God. A wrong view of God, a wrong view of who God is and what he is like, that is also a barrier. The purpose of Jesus on the cross wasn't to change God's mind about me. It was to change my mind about God, about what he was like, and about his love for me. This reconciliation, it's not only forgiveness of my sins, it's an airing of hurts and painful beliefs 
misunderstandings about who God was and what his purpose was and how he was going to treat me and interact with me. Only in naming the accusations that I hold in my heart against God can I then allow God to address them. Have you ever been on that end of a dispute where someone, you can tell someone holds something against you? They believe that you've done something against them, that you've done something to harm them, but they won't bring it up. They won't tell you about it, and they won't give you an opportunity to either apologize or explain that that was never true. They just hold it in silence, and they treat you with as though you're guilty. They convict you without a trial. Sometimes that's what we do to God. We convict him as being a punishing, harsh dictator. We don't even give him the fairness of a trial. The reconciliation process allows grievances to be brought to light. Grievances on all sides. And sometimes that includes me naming and speaking aloud my, my anger, my hurt, my um, frustration with God. You might say, oh, we can't do that. That's not okay. Yes, it is. If we don't do that, then we are convicting God without a trial. This reconciliation process is equally for me to acknowledge where I have been and what I have done and who I am and my, my own sinfulness. And also for me to accuse, to name the ways that I believe that God has been unfair so that I can give him the opportunity to show me what it is that he is like, to show me who it is that he is and how he feels about me. In Paul's opinion, his great purpose is to facilitate reconciliation between God and the people he meets. He believes that is our purpose too. So what does reconciliation look like? Well, communicating God's desire to be in relationship with us, not to accuse us or to hold our sins against us. That's, that's our purpose. That is our job. It's a radical idea. Paul believed that this was an idea worth suffering for. These days, we might need a little help to see our true purpose. There are many things that can distract us. Maybe some of you are experiencing physical pain, um, an illness, or a disability, or something that causes you to feel pain daily. Maybe some of you are living in fear, fear of, of getting COVID, fear of you losing your livelihood, fear of your business or your job being shut down. Maybe, on the other hand, some of you are, are living with excitement and, and success. Success can be a barrier, and it can distract us, um, building our brand and being something, being who it is that we want to be in the world. This can distract us. Maybe you're experiencing relationship struggles, difficulties with a relationship with a child or a parent or a spouse, a brother or a sister. These can distract, understandably so. But Paul wants to remind us that no matter if we're experiencing all these things, that doesn't mean we're not fit to do this work. Our purpose is still true. Our purpose as ambassadors, reconciliation ambassadors for God. Our calling is to be God's love letters to the world. To cast the vision for, of God that we first glimpsed when our hearts were opened by the love of Christ. Remember that? The first time you experienced the love of Christ flooding into your soul and you experienced relief at the idea that God wasn't out to get you, but that God loved you and wanted a relationship with you. That, that vision is, is yours to share. It is yours to communicate to the world. No matter what other distractions are happening in your life, this is your great purpose. And Paul believed it was very much worth suffering for. I want to read you a little excerpt from um, a book. It's actually by my favorite author, or one of my favorite authors. I have many. Um, Kathleen Norris. It's from her book, Amazing Grace. Kathleen writes, Jacob's theophany, his dream of angels on a stairway to heaven, 
strikes me as an appealing tale of unmerited grace. Here's a man who has just deceived his father and cheated his brother out of an inheritance. But God's response to finding Jacob vulnerable, sleeping all alone in open country, is not to strike him down for his sins, but to give him a blessing. Jacob wakes from the dream in awe, exclaiming, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. For once, his better instincts take hold, and he responds by worshiping God. He takes the stone that he kept close by all night, perhaps to use as a weapon if a wild animal or his furious brother Esau were to attack him, and sets it up as a shrine, leaving it for future travelers so that they too will know that this is a holy place, the dwelling place of God. I love this story so much, this, this way of looking at the story of Jacob sleeping uh, with his head on this stone, holding on maybe for dear life to this stone, and God showing up and blessing him. Jacob, who deserved no blessing, who deserved maybe a admonition. And God shows up and, and just bestows this beautiful blessing on him, this glimpse of God being there. And Jacob takes that stone and he sets it up. And I can just see in my life the places where I have taken the stone that I was holding on to tightly when God showed up in my life. And I have set it up as a memorial. I have set it up. It is our purpose to take our stones, to take the experiences that we have had when God has revealed himself to us in such intimate and beautiful ways, and to make them known, to put them on display, to let others see in to the ways that God has met us. And Jacob did this with setting up that stone. All right, we're on to the last, the last section. It's the end of chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 21, and then the first two verses of chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. And I wondered, what is the righteousness of God? In what way do we become that righteousness? And also, how could someone receive God's grace in vain? That sounds scary. So before changing our minds about what God is like and about how God views us and loves us, we could not view God another way. You know, think back to how you felt and what you believed about God before you glimpsed God through Christ, before you glimpsed this God who loves and, and think about how you felt about God. You couldn't muscle your way into thinking about God a different way. You were blind to all the ways that maybe you had been wooed and blessed and cared for by God because you couldn't see them. You were blind to them because you only could see God as judging, as a punisher. And so you were blind to all the goodness and all the kindnesses that he showed you. In truth, the righteousness or the acts of goodness of God, they were invisible. Before we were able to see God as one who loved us, we were like an insecure teenager. I've experienced some teenagers in my house, and um, an insecure teenager can be very difficult because they see hostile judgment everywhere, even when it isn't there. And we were like that. We saw God as hostile and judgmental of us, even when he was showing us kindness. But now God has given us the honor of being his righteousness, his acts of goodness in the world. 
we get to display the love of God to others. As I said earlier, we get to be God's love letters to the world. He's given us that honor. But in being that love letter to the world or in displaying the love of God to others, we need to remind ourselves that we're not doing it as a tactic of manipulation or to try to get people to sign up for Christianity like some pyramid scheme, but as a living, breathing proclamation of the love of God for the world. That is our purpose. That is our mission. That is our honor. If we accept the calling to bring about reconciliation as Paul did, we indeed become the righteousness of God. If instead we refuse the lens of God's love for the world and insist on using Christianity as a tool to dominate one another through guilt or force, Paul would say that we have received God's grace in vain. I'd like to leave it there with that very kind of heavy thought because I'd like us to think on that through the week. How, how do we choose to become the righteousness of God or to receive God's grace in vain? And I'd like to end with a prayer. It's, it's actually called the Prayer of St. Francis. But when I looked it up, apparently it doesn't seem to have been written by St. Francis at all. Um, if you have printed out your outline, then on the back you will see that it is, or maybe you've printed it on two sheets, it is written there. And if you wanted to pray it through the week, then that might be something we can do together, even though we're apart. So I'd like to read it for us this morning. When I finished kind of writing this message, the words of this came to me, it just came in my head as a, as a song. I've heard it as a song before, and I just felt like this prayer is such a, a beautiful um, way to sum up what Paul was teaching. And so I'm going to read it for us, and feel free to read along if you'd like to. Read out loud. Saying words out loud can have um, an ability to affect our, our own hearts and our ability to receive those words. But if you just want to listen, that is fine too. This is a prayer for us all, and... Um, I, yeah, I'd, I'd welcome you joining in with me. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring love. Where there is offense, let me bring pardon. Where there is discord, let me bring union. Where there is error, let me bring truth. Where there is doubt, let me bring faith. Where there is despair, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, let me bring your light. Where there is sadness, let me bring joy. O oh, Master, let me not seek as much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that one receives. It is in self-forgetting that one finds. It is in pardoning that one is pardoned. It is in dying that one is raised to eternal life. Amen. We have some questions. I have a couple of questions. Um, I know that we're not, uh, we're not physically meeting in our groups. I know that many of you are meeting virtually after the service. I have a couple of questions for you. For those who are not meeting, maybe, you're, maybe you d are alone much of the time. These are beautiful questions that you can contemplate on your own. They don't require answers, just a contemplative heart. Um, so uh, the first question is, name some truths about your own value based on the love of Christ that aren't apparent from an outside view. And the second question is, what is the la when is the last time that you acted like a love letter from God? Maybe it's more recently than you think. 
Be creative and think about your answers and bless you all.